This podcast is made possible by the Holy Prize for Blind Ambition, organized by the San Francisco Lighthouse for the Blind. So today we're at the, the University of Queensland, Queensland. It's beautiful uh, heritage buildings that are strewn all across the campus in St. Lucia, sunny Brisbane in Australia. And we're about to go and see Dr. Tamar Davis in the physics building to talk about dark energy, uh, supernovas, and radio galaxies. Let's go. All right, so we've arrived. Um, at the uh, physics uh, and mathematics uh, building uh, in uh, UQ. Again, I would say the beautiful St. Lucia campus. <laughs> and we're here, thank you very much, with Professor Tamara Davis. Uh, and she is a um, professor in astrophysics in first and third years. And she also does a lot of research in overseas. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the work, uh, which the exciting work which is happening uh, nowadays uh, across the globe and I'll hand it to you. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, uh, great to be here and an exciting project. So, you want to know a bit about my research? Uh, yes, so we'd love to, to see, you know, what is, uh, what is current for you right now. Uh, so the exciting stuff with my research at the moment is I'm working on a couple of really big projects. Uh, two of them called the Dark Energy Survey and the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. So DES and DESI are their acronyms. Um, uh, so the Dark Energy Survey, we've done already taken six years of observations on a telescope in Chile, mm -hmm. where we're scanning about an eighth of the entire sky, a big patch that you can see in the, in the southern sky. So if you look at the sky, it would be a bit about that big. Um, and uh, we monitored that and scanned that for the last uh, six years with the purpose of mapping the distribution of galaxies that's there mm -hmm. and looking at the bending of light due to uh, gravity bending the path of light that comes towards us, which is known as gravitational lensing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we've got uh, 300 million galaxies already in the catalogue uh, and that's a huge number of galaxies with which we can map the cosmos. So we use the reason it's called the Dark Energy Survey is we're using these to measure what the universe is made of. Because the pattern of galaxies, as it turns out, is not entirely random. Yes. There's patterns in there, and we can use those patterns as a ruler to measure the expansion history of the universe and also measure how quickly things are growing, so how strong gravity is on different scales. Okay. And the second project, DESI, is going to do a smaller number. It's going to do 30 million galaxies, which is still an enormous number of galaxies. Uh, and but it's going to do very precise distances as well as mapping sort of the two-dimensional distribution and getting approximate distances. Desi's going to map a really d detailed map of 30 million galaxies uh, in the universe, which will give us uh, again. This is the most detailed map that anyone will ever have made, and it will give us a real definitive measurement of whether the expansion of the universe is speeding up more and more with time, or slowing down, etc. Um, so that we can understand what's causing that acceleration of the universe. Of the universe. Uh, so ever since the un we discovered that the universe is expanding, yeah. um, we had assumed, humanity had assumed, that, that gravity would be slowing down that expansion. So mm -hmm. the galaxies are all moving away from each other. Yeah, yeah. And you um, assume that the galaxies or the, the points are kind of pulling each other back. Yeah, so gravity should pull, right? Yeah. I, Get out of the chair. I just did a little experiment. There's a reason we can't fly. <laughs> yes, I get pulled back down to Earth. So if, if you've thrown galaxies away from each other, it's like they've jumped away from each other, whatever pushed them at the beginning of the universe mm -hmm. and just sent them on their way. They're just, if they're just free floating in, and moving out, yeah. gravity should be slowing down, slowing them down. And the question was always, will they slow down enough so that, that they um, get pulled back together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Or will they have the escape velocity? Because even though I can't jump fast enough to escape the gravity of the Earth. If I was able to jump at 11 kilometers per second, that's the escape velocity. I would jump so high that I wouldn't ever come back. Mm. 
So what's escape velocity? So the escape velocity is the velocity you need to escape Earth's gravity. Okay. Or the gravity of the gravity of a, of a, a particular mass. body. Yeah, so. of a particular body. Yeah. yeah. The moon doesn't have as much mass, so it's easier to escape from the moon. The sun's got a lot more mass. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah so. That whether the galaxies will come, will ex- whether the universe will expand forever, so whether the ex- galaxies will continue to move away from each other, mm-hmm. or whether they'll move away, stop, and recollapse, is determined by whether the, uh, the both the initial velocity, the strength yeah. of gravity, um, and the distance mm. between them. Okay. So, so that pretty, pretty much how fast they're moving, and then yeah. um, how strong they are pulling each other. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that means that this um, this survey, the second survey, I guess, which is a bit more focused, uh, you know, which is the DESI, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it does. Sli- there's a couple of slightly different things yeah. that it does. So to, to the thing that was really surprising that was discovered by um, in the late '90s was that, contrary to all expectation, that gravity should be slowing down the expansion, it looks like something is actually speeding up the expansion. Okay. So galaxies are accelerating away from each other, mm-hmm. and we're really not sure why. Mm. So we don't know what's causing that acceleration, but whatever it is, we give it the name dark energy. Mm. And that's what we're trying to figure out with both of these different surveys. Can you just explain dark energy in a... I, I've... Uh, well, this is probably one of the first times that I'm hearing about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've read, I've read the word here and yep. there, everywhere. I just have no idea what it is. Yeah, so <laughs> you're in good company then. Okay. If you don't know what dark energy is, you're sitting out here with all of us in yeah. that sense that dark <laughs> energy is the name we give to whatever is accelerating the expansion of the universe. Mm-hmm. But we have a couple of ideas of what that could possibly be yeah. from theory, but we really don't know what it is yet, and yeah. that's why we're doing all of these surveys, so that we can try and figure it out. Because the answer is almost certainly going to be something really exciting. Yeah. Um, uh, it could be that we need to have a quantum theory of gravity, mm-hmm. for example. Okay. We've got our theory of gravity, general relativity, which yeah. does a great job for making your GPS work and yeah. understanding how to fly. And general relativity is? Um, general relativity is the theory of gravity okay. that we have. Um, <laughs> 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 just, you, you, it's like, so how, how do we, uh, it's okay, it's okay. Okay. So, so generally, I guess like um, gravity uh, has something to do with two different masses which interact with each other, and depending on the proportion, you know, between ma- one mass and the other, gravity actually will uh, have more of a force on the smaller object, which will tend to start orbiting around the larger object, depending on its velocity and its distance, and you know, at some point it would form some kind of stability. But then, when it comes to uh, galaxies, um, I had a question about it: is that do you know the source of expansion? Um, so galaxies work with the same principles as the um, as the orbits of the um, of the s- planets in our solar system. Our sun orbits the galaxy, so there's lots of stars that orbit the um, in the galaxy, mm-hmm. the whole gravitational field of the galaxy, including this massive black hole at the centre. Yep. Um, and uh, but then you asked about what the what caused the expansion, the of, the expansion of the universe. So if you're asking the big questions that we don't know the answers to yet, how did it actually begin? Mm. What was there a real beginning? Was there a continuation of something that was there before? Mm-hmm. Are there other universes being born all the time? Um, these are questions that we have theories of, about that we or we have ideas about, mm. but we don't have a concrete answer. Okay. Uh, and just like we don't know exactly what happens at the center of the black hole. And one of the reasons we don't have a concrete answer is because we need both a theory of um, the, the theory of general relativity, which is a theory of gravity, yep. and the theory of quantum physics. When we get some to something that scale, you're talking about something really small and really, really dense. And we yep. know mm-hmm. that both theories would be important in that situation, but we also know that those theories don't play nice together. They don't. Yeah, they don't yeah. agree on on different uh, observations. Yeah. So you. Um, Quantum physics does a fantastic job of predicting particles and uh, all, doing all the measurements of all, all of the particle interactions that we can see. Yeah. But we, it doesn't have the flexibility of time, for example, that mm. general relativity has. Mm. General relativity works, um, we explain how gravity works by looking at curved space. Uh, and you also get things like time dilation in general relativity, where time flows differently depending on your state of acceleration or motion state of um, motion if you're moving fast Mm -hmm. so time runs differently depending on your state of motion if you're moving fast 
uh, pass something, you're, the person that you're passing and you will disagree on the rate that your watches tick. Mm-hmm. Tick, yeah. And I remember. I remember when I was young. I used to, we used to. I used to play uh, soccer with my brother in the thing, and that was when I first noticed that uh, sound was different. Mm-hmm. There's, I a saw time, some, there's a delay yeah, of sound. Yeah. So you see someone like bang a bang a soccer ball on the ground or something, or kick yeah. it, and then like a couple seconds later, you hear the, yeah. the sound. Yeah. So, um, but here we get back to the big problem that I was uh, we, that you initially asked me about. Yeah. Because we're like, how did the universe begin? What's at the center of a black hole? Where we might prob- we almost certainly need these two theories, quantum and general relativity, to work together. Mm. The general relativity has curved space and time is flexible depending on your who's counting. Yeah. Um, but in quantum physics, there's no such flexibility. In quantum physics, our equations at the moment don't give us the ability to have warping time or have uh, a warped space. Mm. And so the attempt to get quantum physics and general relativity to work together is in part, or the reason that they don't work together is in part because there's not that flexibility. Mm -hmm. And so we think that if we can understand a quantum theory of gravity, we might be able to understand something like how did the universe begin and the question of what happens at the centre of black holes. And the reason dark energy is so interesting is that it might also be a feature of quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. Okay. The leading candidate for what dark energy might be is actually the energy of the vacuum itself. Mm-hmm. And this is a f- yep. something that comes out of um, quantum physics, is that even if you take everything out, there's no matter, there's no light, there's nothing, you've just got vacuum, mm-hmm. you can't, you don't get to zero energy. There is still some form of energy yeah, which exists. A, a zero, zero energy, and it's... Um, Related to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, yep. where you yeah, can't know the, yeah. the momentum and the position of something perfectly. Of something perfectly yeah. um, and interestingly, the vacuum energy that's predicted there has the right properties to accelerate the universe. Mm. So you're like, wow, we're done. We've just figured out something where quantum physics and, and general relativity really are needed to work together. But the predictions for how much of that stuff in quantum physics or how much vacuum energy there is are way off. Um, up to 120 orders of magnitude, or um, it's a slightly hand-waving instrument, but they're really, really bad. And so maybe quantum gravity will explain why the vacuum energy takes the value it does and explain what dark energy energy is. That's one of my hopes. Okay. That's some really, that's some really complex questions yeah. that need answering. <laughs> um, okay. There was, I wanted to kind of bring it back yes. to, you know, the some of the initial... Um, you know, to the source of why we're trying to really kind of measure these phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Um, there is, you know, you spoke about uh, black holes and, you know, which are in, uh, they are called supermassive black holes. Mm-hmm. At the centers of galaxies. At the centers of yep. galaxies. Um, those are also called active galactic nuclei. Yeah, so the one, the supermassive black holes, which we think are at the center of uh, every large galaxy, are sort of that the every galaxy is built around one of these but some galaxies have lots of gas and dust left in them mm-hmm. and that's still actively getting sucked into that black hole yeah. and when that happens as the gas gets sucked into the very central regions of the galaxy it gets compressed and hot mm. and so it can glow very brightly yeah so these active galaxies are ones that are clearly very bright because they've got this disk Um, sort of like a Saturn-like disk around the black hole at the Mm centre. You can't see the black hole, but the stuff it's sucking in is getting so hot and energetic that that glows really brightly. And so those are known as active galaxies. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then we can't just take a picture uh, of the black hole in the centre of our galaxy uh, with a camera. So we can take a picture with a camera. The problem is that, because it's just normal light coming off, some of it will come off in x-rays, some of it will come off in the infrared, some of it will come off in visible light. And this is the gas getting sucked into it. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. But, um, so it's just normal light. The problem is, these things are so far away and so compact mm-hmm. that they look tiny. So even with the Hubble Space Telescope, mm. if you, which is the, one of our highest resolution cameras that's up in space, it's, you don't get the blurring of the atmosphere and that kind mm. of thing. The whole... Um, black hole with the disk of gas around it is way smaller than a pixel on that camera. So you can actually see uh, the um, active galaxy light on a normal camera. It's just that the resolution has to be super, super high, way higher than possible. Even with our our best space telescopes, uh, the 
entirety of the black hole, the disk around it, all the gas fills up like one pixel in the middle of your image. So to understand what's going on in the structure, we can't use a normal photograph yeah. because all of the information that we want is in this one little dot. Mm -hmm. It gives us some info, yeah. but we need more. Mm. So, so there's the, there was the uh, the latest um, announcement, uh, which was a, a worldwide collaboration, I think. And the technique they actually used was to make it so that all of the ground-based telescopes and orbital uh, telescopes uh, were placed into, were kind of merged as if they were being one giant yeah. lens. Yeah, so I don't think they put any orbital ones in this, but they used a okay. whole bunch of radio telescopes on the ground yep. um, and made, pretended that it was sort of like one big dish. So when you're using a telescope to observe the sky, yep. the resolution is determined by the maximum size of your mirror or whatever's doing yep. the reflecting. Yep. And there's two things that you want a big mirror for. One is to get that high resolution, and the other is to just catch a lot of light. So mm -hmm. if you're looking at something really faint, yeah. you want a really big uh, mirror to catch a lot of light. Mm -hmm. When we're looking at these central black holes and galaxies, they're actually quite bright. So we don't care about catching lots of light. We just care about the really big mirror. Yeah. And so effectively what this, they do with the radio telescopes is they have them literally basically on the other different sides of the earth as far away as you can while still looking at the same patch of sky above you yeah. and they put all of those together they um, basically it's like having a fragmented mirror where you've got a little piece of mirror over there and a little piece of mirror over there and a little piece of mirror over there mm -hmm. yeah. but by very precise timing you can tell what lands on each part of the mirror yeah. um, at a particular time and it's easier to do with radio telescopes than optical ones because the radio wavelengths are long so you don't have to be quite as precise mm. with your timing. But by doing that, they effectively have a mirror that's the size of the Earth. Yep. It just doesn't have quite the collecting area of the Earth. So you can get the resolution as though you had a mirror the size of the Earth mm -hmm. even though you don't quite get the sensitivity. Yeah. Um, and that's the trick that they used to be able to actually image one of these black holes. So you know how I said a normal camera, you can get all of the light would land on one pixel. Mm -hmm. With this, you could get multiple pixels and actually get enough resolution for one of the really, really close ones of these um, to be able to discover the... Um, that the is Wilson. Fleet time. Hi, Wilson. <laughs> Fleet time, okay. <laughs> but, I mean, you do get... If you want to look in three dimensions, the reason that we have uh, two eyes is you can see the triangle, you can see yeah. three, three dimensions. The further apart you put those... Um, the eyes that sort of better <laughs> you, uh, a three-dimensional sense that you would have the more yeah. you because we lose de depth perception from the two our two eyes at only yeah. a few meters really yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you um, so there's that that analogy with uh, seeing things in three dimensional three mm -hmm. dimensions but it's the actual combining the light in a particular way as and knowing exactly when the photons are landing on this telescope and when they land on this mm -hmm. and then in the computer reconstructing that as though it was one big image yeah. um, that is the uh, thing that makes this really special okay. and so it was able to measure the highest resolution um, ever of a object like this and I wonder if it's the high it's definitely the highest resolution targeted at the, at the center <laughs> a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy yeah. um, and what you, they were able to see which was just a, absolutely mind-blowing they saw exactly what had been predicted which is you've got the a black shadow essentially yep. from the black hole and a ring around it mm -hmm. and interestingly so the ring around it is that hot gas mm -hmm. that's falling in yeah and interestingly the re it's not necessarily for the ring to be oriented sort of directly so you've got the black hole and the ring going around this way mm -hmm. it can also be um aligned perpendicular to us so that the it would we would be looking edge on to the rings and because of the gravity of the black hole the light would get bent as it was emitted up and down mm -hmm. from the back side of the ring yeah. it gets bent around and would come towards you yeah. and so it, no matter what the orientation the black hole would look like it had a ring around it okay yeah. so so yeah so why what is is the shadow 
at the middle of the uh, the black hole due to yeah so the, yeah yeah well, if we're looking at something that's a, a disk of material around the black hole yeah then it's not a sphere it's not encompassing the whole thing it's not falling in from all directions it's as I said sort of imagine the disks the rings of Saturn mm-hmm. yeah if you're looking at the rings of Saturn edge on you can almost not see that they're there because they're so thin um, and the, these disk patterns appear all over the galaxy and all, or all over the universe in a variety of different places. You yeah. see the rings of Saturn um, forming. You see our, our solar system is in a big disk around our sun. Yeah. You see these the disks of all of the stars yeah. around the central black hole of the galaxy. And yeah. really close to that black hole, you've got these accretion disks, these hot disks of gas that are really close. Yeah. And that happens because of angular momentum. When things are, sp- if anything's spinning, as they compress, uh, as a, as the cloud of stuff gets smaller, yeah. it will tend to form a disk. And that's a common thing that happens at all sorts of different scales in yeah. the universe, from the planets to the galaxies, to the and it happens around these supermassive black holes. So that means that we could also see a supermassive black hole, which may not have a disk, which is facing us directly. Yes, that absolutely. Which could also be oblique, or you know that that yeah, as yeah. you said, that looks a bit like the ring on Saturn. Yeah. Okay. Because Saturn doesn't have enough gravity to be able to pull the light and make it make us be able to see the disks that are hidden behind the planet, but a black hole has enough gravity that even if the the disk is completely behind the black hole relative to us, mm-hmm. the light would get pulled up and then. Um, bent around the black hole and it would look like it's coming to us from above the black hole and below the black hole even though it should it's actually um, hidden and there's a the movie interstellar yep. was one that they used real simulations of black holes and disks around them to make the animation that was used in that movie and so that's really genuinely what it would look like and where we've got a bit of a stripe of color in front where the disk is and then this yep. ring around just like uh, you know, Jake was talking about the sound, which is a bit of delay when you actually hit it from a, from a different area on the field, and if yeah. you, more distance you get, you know, the uh, the more delay you actually have in uh, hearing that sound. So in the same respect, the light is also doing the same thing. Yeah, the key thing with the Doppler effect that you were just describing is not the time it takes for the light to reach you, but rather just simply the fact that you're moving with respect to each other. Yeah. So you can imagine if I'm running towards you, and I'm you got a spear in one hand. Uh, I've got a, I've got a, I was thinking I had a, a, like a, a flashlight or something, and yeah. I flash my, my um, flashlight and it, um, uh, or a laser pointer or whatever we want, and I, yeah. and I flash it once per second. Yeah. Then as I'm running towards you, those uh, you'll receive those flashes more frequently than more one per more. second. And in that case, it's because of the light travel time. Yeah. Um, but... There's the Doppler shift that we're talking about in special relativity and stuff is just the the relative motion of uh, the two objects yep. means that you get this um, the change of frequency mm-hmm. um, relative to something else and it's one of the easiest ways to measure that whether something's moving or not. Yep. We use that for galaxies. Yep. Uh, it was discovered in the 1920s that if you measure the spectra of galaxies, so the rainbow of light that the galaxies emit, we use the sharp spectral lines, so really bright emission at particular wavelengths that come from different elements, yep. to, as a fingerprint. And we can see that fingerprint that is sometimes moved to the red and sometimes moved to the blue. Mm-hmm. If it's moved to the blue, that's because something's moving towards you. If it's moved to the red, it's because something's moving away. Right. And basically all of the galaxies are moved towards the red, and so they're all moving away. That's how you understand that it's still And that's how, we, that's how it was initially discovered that the universe is expanding. Yeah. the velocity is proportional to the distance. Yeah. The ones that are further away are moving faster, which is consistent with if you if everything started quite the whole observable universe started quite close together in, in the Big Bang mm-hmm. or shortly thereafter, the things that were moving faster would have gotten further by now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a question in regards to that. Yep. So apparently the Andromeda galaxy mm-hmm. is entering into a collision course yeah. with our Milky Way. Yeah, uh, that's why I put the almost yeah. On the almost every galaxy is <laughs> moving away from us. Yeah, that's 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 very interesting. So that means um, what you're doing is you're able to use the Doppler shift. So as it turns red, or you get a certain measure of that Doppler shift mm-hmm. uh, to understand 
you know how fast they're actually uh, moving away from each other. Um, now this kind of brings into one of the topics that you're working on, which is uh, reverberation mapping. Yep. Uh, could you explain to us what that, you know, how yeah. you know how that works? I do know on a very surface level. The, the important thing for reverberation is that it's being emitted from different regions, and that's the key thing. So, mm. what's happening? Um, oh, and by the way, the Doppler shift and, and the measuring of uh, how fast galaxies are moving away are really important for the supernova measurement that discovered the acceleration of the universe, mm -hmm. which was in the 90s, which I was talking about before. But we can get back to that. <laughs> for reverberation mapping, what we actually look at is you've got this hot disk of gas that's around the central supermassive black hole. Yeah. And that's Multiple black holes or just one single? Just one, usually. Yeah. Um, and that hot gas we observe in pictures as that single pixel at the centre. Yeah. Or if it's a bit blur more blurry, it just gets blurred out. But um, we can measure how bright that is. Mm. And interestingly, it changes a bit with time. Yeah. Because clumps of gas might fall in, uh, stars kind of might get frames? gobbled up. Weeks to, really? well, actually weeks? days to weeks to oh, months, cool. depending on the object. That's the bigger cool. ones tend to have slower... Yeah. Um, processes. And that's why it's so important as well for um, the uh, DES and DESI survey to increase the timeline in which it captures that information. Yeah, so I was describing the wide field DES survey before and yeah. that was like observing this big patch of sky yeah. and we've gone back and viewed, viewed every patch of the sky ten times. That's not really enough to capture the variations that we want to see, mm -hmm. both for reverberation mapping and for supernovae. So yeah. we had ten patches where we observed um, every week. As much as we could and so we have hundreds of data points for those mm -hmm. so that's the um, that's the sort of parts of the sky that we looked for the time varying things and that's where we were looking at we were watching um, almost 800 supermassive black holes and we have monitored them for the last six years mm -hmm. and what happens is the the gas around the black hole itself varies and we see that in the pictures and those pixels vary yeah, and yeah. so it just gets brighter and fainter over time. Brighter and fainter. So we write, we call that a light curve because it goes up and down and up and down, yep. and, and that's the um, the light curve of the photometry, the photometry pictures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then that light um, gets emitted from there. It also gets essentially reflected off a bunch of clouds around it. Mm -hmm. So okay. orbiting at quite a big, much greater distance. So not right beside the black hole, but at something that is like days or weeks or months away, mm -hmm. um, are these clouds of um, dust and gas that are orbiting. Yeah. And the light bounces off them. They sort of absorb it and re-emit it as a spectrum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we re-emit it in spectral lines, basically. And so you see these sharp emission lines. If you take both the images that we're taking with the dark energy camera, but then also go back and take spectra, mm -hmm. You can watch the strength of these emission lines changing as well, okay. and so you look at the time difference between the variations in the um, pictures yep. in the brightness yep. and the variations in the emission lines in the spectra, and that time difference tells you the distance between the center and where these clouds are. So it's just as if you were in a room or could, uh, well, let's say a big hall mm -hmm. with different objects between you and the wall and the ceiling, mm -hmm. and you have one sound which is coming out of an area yep. but then in that sound bounces and that kind of causes the delay which is reverberation yeah. but you're actually using it in the context of uh, the photometry and the yeah. light so um, yeah. exactly so it's like the uh, um, the echo reverberation that you would get yeah. for the bats use to find their way in the dark and we're doing uh, that over yeah. millions of light years. Yeah, so it's not yeah. sound bouncing off something, it's actually yeah. light. Light. Because th these things are so vast that it takes light weeks to get across, yeah. and then it bounces off this cloud of gas and it comes to us and we see it. Yeah. And the really cool thing that we can do with this is because the, the gas is moving quite quickly, because yeah. yeah. it's orbiting this black hole, and we can measure how quickly that gas is moving, mm -hmm. and once we know the distance from the black hole, if you know how fast something is orbiting at a particular distance, the thing that you can figure out is the mass of the thing that it's orbiting. Mm -hmm. So we can, we're can we using this to weigh supermassive black holes, mm. to calculate their mass, and we're looking at the most distant ones that we're looking at emitted the light we're seeing about 12 billion years ago. So the universe is 13.8 billion 13. years old. Yeah. Um, so it's very close, I mean, yeah. 
relatively in terms of you know the, the, the age of the universe is yeah. very very close to the beginning exactly using this technique we can go almost back to the beginning of time to the time of some very early galaxies and look at what the galaxies look like in the very early universe compare that to what they look like now and understand how galaxies evolved how black holes have grown over time and measure the differences in mass and the differences in galaxies near and far and that we definitely can't do even with this new technique that's able to the event horizon telescope which looked at the image of a, a black uh, a black hole with the disk around it yeah. that was the one of the most nearby galaxies with the biggest supermassive black hole one of the biggest supermassive black holes in it okay. and so even the very very nearby ones are really really hard to image yeah. but thanks to this time delay technique we can get a picture of what the inside of these galaxies look like near their supermassive black holes mm. by using time delays so instead of using uh, an actual picture okay all right uh we're back after uh the camera's heat stroke um so one of the questions I had was about a quasi-stellar object. What is it? Yes, what is it? <laughs> what? Yeah, so that's a, also known as a quasar, quasi-stellar object, quasar, got, it got shortened to. When these active galaxies were first discovered, people didn't really know what they are. And because they were so, they're so bright, they're as bright as a nearby star, mm -hmm. And they, they're, but they're also tiny, so they just look like a point of light. So people thought that they were stars, because you didn't have any extra information. Yeah. But when you looked at the spectrum of it, it just had lines that were all in all sorts of crazy places. Like you couldn't, people couldn't identify what elements it was made out of. Um, and using the same techniques as the pixel camera. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, using the spreading out the rainbow of colors of, <laughs> of the light and looking at the, the emission lines, yeah. Yeah. it wasn't a fingerprint that people recognized until they realized that that fingerprint had been redshifted so far that they were looking at a whole bunch of emission lines that people hadn't even really thought of mm. yet. And these things were, were not stars at all. They were really far away galaxies that just happened to be very bright and very pinpointy in the sky. And so that was the, that's what a quasi-stellar object quasi -stellar. is. Um, and okay. it, after there, there used to be all of these different types of objects, um, there's, uh, quasars and blazars and active galactic nuclei of different types and separate galaxies and things and people slowly realized um, that what we were looking at wasn't a whole bunch of different types of objects it was the same type of object looked at from different orientations from different orientations okay <laughs> um, yeah yeah so some of them so these things basically imagine you've got a donut with a skewer through the center the central hole mm -hmm. And there's a black hole right at the center. The skewer is like these jets of gas that are being um, poured out. And yes, and the thing the, that gets lit up. Um, yeah, so that's really bright. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you have the, the a dusty torus around it, which is like the donut, which is um, not as energetic as the jets coming out. Yeah. And that's sort of all embedded in the galaxy. Mm. And so when you put this all together, if you're looking at that edge on, you can't actually see the set down into this bit that we've been talking about, we can't see the disk around the black hole because it's obscured by that dusty sort of donut. Mm. Whereas if you're looking directly down one of the beams, you see something very different because you're getting shot at by a bunch of like really high energy ra radiation. Mm. And if you're looking at it obliquely on sort of a diagonal angle, you can sort of see into the center, you get some of the torus, you get some of this. And so the light, the spectrum that we were getting looked quite different from all of these objects until it was all put together into one big picture and we realized that you're look, actually looking at the same type of object, just from very different directions. And so the the that technique, which uh, I think it was uh, started in the 1800s, which was to put it, put the light coming through uh, into a prism to um, spread yeah, to, to get the spectrum. Yeah, to get the to get the spectrum. Yeah, I don't know when they were when spectra were first, but as as long as we've had prisms, I guess, uh, or like. Glass. Don't quote me on this, yeah. but I think it was a Dutch guy in the 1800s. Uh -huh. <laughs> I can't remember the name though. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so this technique is also used in many other objects, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, star systems. Yeah, we, um, it's our main way of understanding the universe is to split the light up into its colors and look at different things. Because yeah. if something's hot, it tends to be blue. If something's 
cooler, it tends to glow in the red. To glow in the red, um, yeah. Just like your flame, you know that your blue flame for yep. your gas mm. stove is hotter than the, the red flame that you get up from a match or That's something right. like that. And so with those techniques, um, and also with the um, reverberation mapping, you're able to uh, calculate the actual mass of a black hole. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we're taught the things that we're looking at are typically millions or billions of times the mass of our sun. Wow. And that is in a much, much smaller uh, area. Yeah, the, the ones that are billions of times the mass of our sun can be bigger than our sun. So the, the okay. event, usually we talk about the size of a black hole as being the size of the event horizon. Event horizon. So that's the point of no return. If you get closer than that, you're not escaping again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the event horizon can be can actually be quite big for one of these ones that's billions of times the mass of our sun, mm -hmm. like to, on the scale of the orbit of the Earth from the sun, for example, that kind of size. Uh, and or even our solar system. But if you yeah. turned our Earth into a black hole, if you can, took all of the Earth to make it a black hole, you just have to make it really dense. You'd have to take the whole Earth and compress it into something about the size of a teaspoon. Wow. Um, there have been some papers out there which were talking about going through the black hole and somehow uh, apparently there's some articles out there which are starting to theorize on an object which is kind of the opposite side of the black hole, which they call white holes. Mm. Um, have you heard something about that? Yeah, so it, maths is tricky. It's very yeah. entertaining sometimes, mathematics. <laughs> uh, you can um, use it if, you, if you've got quantum physics and things, you, you can look at the maths that describes the particles you see and do things amazing like predict the well if this maths is true and explain and is a good explanation of what we've seen then this other thing must be true and the and the other thing is we must have a Higgs boson we must have a neutrino like mm -hmm. different it actually predicted the existence of particles mm -hmm. that we've never seen and we went out and measured them and that was true and maths is amazing if that what um, that you're able to predict the real world so effectively mm -hmm. by looking at the mathematics. Now, just because it's mathematically uh, possible doesn't mean it actually comes to fruition. There have been lots of mathematically possible uh, things mm -hmm. that have shown to be not true. So they're, they're dead ends, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, the vast majority of um, ideas that you can possibly come up with are going to be wrong. Um, so, but... For in, you were talking, I, I brought up this because the, the white holes are a mathematical possibility within the theory of, um, of uh, relativity. Relativity. And yeah. You can have wormholes as well, so mm -hmm. that's theoretically possible. Yeah. Where you have, um, if you imagine space time as like a sheet, mm -hmm. it's basically sort of like ripping a hole in the sheet and making a connection from one point to another, so it's like a tunnel. Yeah. And so you can, it's one way that people have considered moving uh, faster than the speed of light or going uh, traveling in time is to take a shortcut through using the features of curvature of space to rip apart a hole in this one and attach it somewhere else and go go it's basically cheating finding a tunnel uh, but that, that violates too many it's mathematically viable it does work mathematically hmm. uh, but you any... need the problem is you need negative energy to hold the mouth of the wormhole open for you to be able to traverse this worst wormhole okay. and we don't necessarily know that negative energy is a thing that possibly exists it's like having negative mass you can't be less than zero kilos mm -hmm. yeah. you can speculate I can put a negative sign in the equation and say hey yeah. let's see what happens when we put negative mass in there yeah. it doesn't mean that that's actually possible the average density of the universe is mm -hmm. um, decreasing as everything gets away from everything else and so we get more, yeah. more empty places beside the big dense things so the eventual future of our galaxy is to be sitting alone with our, our few sort of galaxies like Andromeda that we've already sort of captured gravitationally, yeah. Yeah. and then all of the other galaxies will be will end up zooming away and to the point that we cannot even see them anymore. So mm. we just end up with this little patch of the universe that we can see. Uh, for those who are terrified, it's not going to happen very soon. So we have yeah. <laughs> hundreds of billions of years. Don't worry, it's all like good. Thirteen Milky Way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is actually, you know, a, a really fascinating thing. But 
what is the actual origin of a black hole? Uh, you know, we spoke about supernova, mm -hmm. uh, but not as much in length as uh, with black holes. Yeah. Uh, so supernova, kind of to put it simply, is basically a star which has collapsed on itself because it wasn't, you know, it didn't have enough fuel anymore. And because of the, the lack of fuel, then it mm -hmm. collapses. But then, depending or on it, the... Or it started burning fuel too vigorously and sort of exploded itself. But uh, we can okay. go into detail on that, yeah. Yeah, okay, so, yeah, which... <laughs> <laughs> this is why we're here too. <laughs> um, so when it collapses, mm -hmm. there are two variations? Yes, there's a couple of ways that you can make a star explode. Yeah. Number one, you've got a star by itself, and the normal life process of a star is that it will start burning, for example, hydrogen. By burning, I mean it's fusing, so they you bash the hydrogen atoms together and make helium. Mm -hmm. um, then once that gets uh, there's too much helium in the center the star will start to collapse a bit it'll heat up the helium a bit more and that will um, ig start igniting helium so helium will merge and make heavier elements and that will go on until you've got iron and iron's the step beyond which if you fuse things instead of creating energy and giving enough energy to hold the star up and keep the center hot it sucks energy out of the environment. Mm. It's actually it actually takes energy out in order to make this, and so that that is when the center of the um, star basically has burned too long and too hot, and it ends up um, sucking all the energy out of the center, so it can't hold itself up against its own gravity anymore, as you were sort of saying. And the um, at that point, the star collapses and goes mm. and, and has a big shock wave and bounces out and explodes. And mm. you can have a black hole forming in the center of a really big star yeah. when it goes through one of those collapse processes. Yeah. Um, the other way that you can explode a star is if you've got two stars side by side yeah. um, and this is the type 1a supernovae that we um, have where you've got one that's a white dwarf so it's, a, it's an old dead star that didn't have, didn't have, never got energetic enough to make a big kaboom when it died. It just sort of got, ran out of fuel and then just sort of settled and mm -hmm. nothing much happened. So it's mm. just a hot ball of gas. Yeah. Uh, and if you have another star around it, it can add material onto that. The, the gravity of the white dwarf can start sucking stuff off the other star or it can have a collision with another star like it. And that can push the mass beyond the tipping point where you can turn on thermi um, thermonuclear reactions at the center again. Mm -hmm. And it can then explode. And okay. so you've got a couple of ways in which you can make stars explode. and exactly which ones will make a black hole and which ones won't are uh, it's still the very the, the fine details of that yep. are still um, being figured out figured out but the and that's one of the reasons why we would get excited about like watching gravitational waves from neutron stars colliding and that kind of thing we can get more observational data to support our simulations and theories yeah. um, and uh, but that that would be the standard way where most black holes in the universe are formed Okay, so the way the universe was formed is not necessarily, you know, uh, I mean, it's not, it's not completely known yet, but there are some methods which will allow us, uh, you know, to really kind of understand it a bit more. So initially, the universe did have sound propagating through yeah. it. Yeah. So we, the, very famously, the universe, there's no sound propagating in space at the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's just because we've got these big empty spaces. The universe is mostly empty. And mm -hmm. for sound to propagate, what we're hearing are particles bouncing off each other. Uh, there's a shock wave in the... Yeah. Well, not a shock wave necessarily, but a compression wave yeah. in the air. Yeah. If you go back to the really early universe, if you take all of the material that's really spread out in the universe now and mm -hmm. compress it going back in time, you get to the point where the whole universe was as hot and dense as um, a star. So living back then would have been like living inside a star, but a star that stretched as far as you could go in all directions. Yeah. And so back then, sound was traveling everywhere. And yeah. light particles were participating in the sound wave too, so the sound wave is actually going at more than half the speed of light. Okay. Wow, yeah. 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 So this is, this is pretty ridiculous, but this relates back to the surveys that I'm doing now, the Dark Energy Survey, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument Surveys we're doing, where we're looking for patterns in the galaxies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because the patterns that are in the galaxies were actually laid down in the very early universe mm -hmm. by looking at the um, patterns that were caused by it, or the patterns in the very early universe were caused by sound waves. So, in part, there was gravity and sound waves put together. 
So in this early time, you had these compressions and rarefractions of a sound wave traveling around, and those, those were propagating through the universe all over the place. But the distance that a sound wave could travel from the beginning of the universe to when the universe became so dilute that sound waves couldn't travel anymore mm -hmm. left a certain sort of ruler length on, the, on all of these patterns of waves. Yep. So let me try and explain that a bit more clearly. Sound waves are traveling all over the place in the early universe, but as the universe expanded, the particles got far enough apart that when a compression from the sound wave started, the particles had trouble finding other particles to collide with. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was the point of time where sound sort of froze. It no longer traveled in the universe. Mm. But what was left were the last compressions and rarefractions before that happened, mm -hmm. the last sort of compressions of the sound wave, mm -hmm. were bits of the universe that were denser than their neighbors. And those are the places where galaxies formed. Wow, so, so that kind of gives, it's almost as if... Yeah, so the way that I would I think about it is if, you, if I had a whole bunch of rocks and I threw them into a pond, yeah. and you've got all of the overlapping waves of all of these different water waves traveling, yeah. Yeah. and then you just froze the pond. Yeah. And the pond, so the sound, the waves all of a sudden couldn't travel anymore, yeah. and you've just frozen the pond, and the bits that were the, the troughs and the bits that were the peaks yeah. got stuck, and then, um, and then this is where the analogy breaks down. Uh, the universe keeps expanding, and the um, uh, and the peaks, I guess, where there was more stuff, yeah. is the bit. They're the bits that then suck more matter towards them because they were already denser to start with, mm. and that's where gravity galaxies sort of form. So you get this pattern of galaxies where the galaxies are like particles in an enormous sound wave, mm. and you've got sort of a clump of galaxies over here, and then a gap, and a clump, and a gap. And it's not perfect because it's like you threw a whole bunch of rocks and you've got all of these overlapping waves, so it's quite a complicated pattern. Mm. But the um, it's almost like your frame sample of the camera. Like if you took a shot of it, the camera yeah. frame just kept speeding up. If if I took a shot of the water waves, you mean? So yeah, yeah. Like yeah. go to camera, store it's like stared at the water waves, and mm -hmm. it started at like one frame per second, and then it slowly just started picking up more and more. Yeah, well, it would sort of like uh, it'd slow down a bit and then just freeze. So you take you yeah. took a picture and all of these sound waves are moving and then they just froze. Just froze. Mm. And then and then yeah, galaxies formed in that pattern of that last sort of That's, It feels like it feels almost as though sound created light and matter. It, it, it's it's I don't know. There's there's something Yeah, sound really and light and matter are all interacting really closely. Closely, yeah. At, and well, sound was a wave of light and matter put together. Mm. And then and then that ended up through the expansion of the universe and stuff being on such a grand scale that galaxies formed in the peaks of the sound wave. Wow. If you do look at the distribution of galaxies, we talk about it in terms of clusters and filaments and voids. Uh, and yeah. so you get um, this sort of spider webby like structure of mm -hmm. there's these nodes where lots of stuff comes together and then filaments between them and the galaxies are and there's stuff basically following falling down of these all of these to make the structures we see and you said that wasn't random that's right yeah um, because of the patterns laid down from the very early universe and it, it, if it started completely random to start with yeah the peculiarities of how fast the universe was expanding and how long light could how long the sound waves could travel before the universe became too dilute for sound to travel anymore. That particular distance laid down a particular ruler that now basically lies like a mesh over the entire universe which we can use as like grid paper to measure how much the expansion has changed over time. So we look for this ruler length because even though it got the sound waves froze, mm -hmm. the universe is still expanding. So those the, the ruler is still sort of stretching, not because sound waves are moving, but just because everything is moving away from everything else. Have you seen any good uh, visual representations to kind of pair with that? Um, lots of great numerical simulations that we can that we look at because okay. uh, yeah. they do basically to check that our interpretation is correct. We put in great detail the initial conditions that we can see from the early universe, which we can see in the form of the microwave background, which is light mm -hmm. that was emitted from that very early time, yeah. and compare that, and then we put that initial condition in a simulation, see what happens if you just allow gravity to do its work for 13.8 billion years, yeah. 
and then you see what the pattern of galaxies looks like today mm. and you can compare out and go out and observe and see if that looks like what the, the pattern of galaxies that we see and also look at all of the different distances as well um, sort of halfway back in the universe and you know a few billion years back and does the pattern of galaxies at each stage match what our simulations predict mm. and it does a beautiful job of doing that which is one of the reasons we are so confident in our whole model. Uh, so. So, guys, we're going to now switch to, um, this seemed very technical, <laughs> although, you know, the convers we try to keep the conversation as light as possible, but astrophysics is a complex thing, but mm -hmm. at the same time, it's an, it's, it's an extremely inspiring uh, field, and, you know, that digs all the way down to, you know, fundamental physics, you know, from the micro or the nano, or even, even smaller than the nano, all the way to the macro, uh, I don't know what we would call a universal macro. It's the biggest scale you <laughs> yeah. can get. Um, but we're going to now get into the section of trying to exfoliate um, something interesting using digital signal processing so that people who are visually impaired can understand black holes, supernovas, mm -hmm. and the baryonic uh, acoustic uh, oscillations. oscillations. Yes. Yeah. Or how we can just represent that. So. Press the better. button. Okay, now let's put it to the science part. Can we take a quick, quick break? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that would be great. Thank you so much. Go for a stop capture. Welcome back. Now we're in the science lab part of things. So in this section tomorrow, we're going to try to take you outside of your field mm -hmm. and see how we can creatively illustrate the phenomenons that you have been uh, researching and turn those phenomenon into sound. Yeah. So let's start with some of the, 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 the main data points. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's one which is so, which is the uh, Desi, uh, Des and Desi uh, websites, which actually have uh, all of the results? Uh, some of the results will be yeah. there, and we definitely make all of the data public yeah. as soon as we get it all ready, which takes a little bit of time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so these ones have stretched over 100 days in different seasons, uh, and you've already kind of filtered out when the weather did not permit you know, a proper clear yeah. listening. Uh, of those areas and that is over 100 days so yeah. Okay. Yeah so for the dark energy survey we've yeah. observed uh, for 100 days spread out over six years basically yeah. mm -hmm. um, and we observed in four different colors. And four so different colors. For each of these we took pictures of the sky yeah. and we put like a red filter, a green filter, a blue filter, sort of an infrared filter on our, um, our telescope yeah. Of, so, the, of the overall sky or just like aiming for specific galaxies? Uh, the p image that we take with this is about uh, eight times the area of the full moon. Okay. So one image mm. will be about eight times the area of the full moon. Mm -hmm. And in total, we've covered a patch of the sky that's about an eighth of the entire sky. An eighth sky. of the entire sky in the southern hemisphere. Yeah, so a quarter of what we can see from the southern hemisphere, sort of. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, that information, so, is time-based. Yeah, so we've stacked, what we do with those images is we stack them all up to get the best picture that we can. So we've got some of the time information mm -hmm. as well as the, the very detailed images because we just get all of the photos from photons, all the, the captures from all of the different images, pile them all on top of each other yep. so that uh, we've got a really high signal to noise measurement of each galaxy. Okay. So we've got both the time and the stacks. And the stacks, yeah. And for the, but the, that's for the whole survey. Yeah. And then there's the regions that we've done the particular time domain survey as well, yeah. where we look in more detail, more frequently. Mm -hmm. um, and so... What are those called? Still under the same umbrella? Or? Still under the dark energy survey. Okay. Um, yeah. But there's the dark energy survey supernova fields. And we were looking, they're called the supernova fields because we were looking for supernovae in these fields, in these sort of areas of the sky. Mm. So we're looking for exploding stars. The way you find an exploding star is you look for something that changes in brightness. In brightness. Like an instant. Like a... Well, 
not necessarily. Yeah, I, 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 I guess I'm imagining they phase I mean, in and phase out. But I don't know. They, they do. They, the supernova, the ones that we're looking for, um, will typically brighten and fade over the course of a month or two. A month or two. Okay, so and the capture rate, I think that it's called the um, sorry, uh, cadence. Sorry. Cadence. Yeah. There you go. Yep. Yeah, uh, the capture rate of the light curves is is every half hour, every three hours, or no, once a week. Once a week. Okay. Yeah. So we've got we take each of the the filters. So yeah. we, we get four different images at, on one night, say. Yeah. In the four different colors. Yeah. And then we go back and we look at the same field a week later yeah. and see if there's any new things there that we haven't seen before or if anything that was there has brightened dramatically. And that is what we would expect to see if we were seeing a supernova. So atomically separating the actual or choosing filters allows you to see if there's a, a subtle change in one of the one of the filters mm -hmm. uh, from that point. Okay. Yeah. In, in general, if something gets brighter in one filter, it will get brighter in all of them. In all of them. Yeah. Okay. And, um, the different amounts, to, because sometimes, um, and uh, it will get more bright in the bl like when something's really hot, it will hot, get yeah. blue. So when you have a supernova explosion, it actually starts very hot. Yeah. And so the blue filters will go up first the highest, yeah, and so then as time goes on, the red yeah. will get higher. So yeah. the red kind of delays a bit before it follows with the blue, and then afterwards it just kind of... Yeah. They'll, they'll both go up, but one will go up more first, and then the other one will follow. That's kind of interesting, because that could be translated mm -hmm. uh, into a sound effect. Yeah, because the, the, we call them the light curves when we watch something vary um, in brightness, and that could be translated either as uh, a pitch or a volume, I guess, yep. um, in yeah. sound. So the hue would be, um, there, is, there are two actual dimensions where um, uh, I think the, there's some usefulness uh, to be had from uh, you know, this kind of information is that, so the hue is associated to uh, the frequency mm -hmm. uh, of a sound or a touch, yeah. because touch and sound are kind of, you know, they're interchangeable when it comes to interfacing mm -hmm. uh, with the way we perceive things. And uh, so the hue, could be the frequency and the brightness could be the intensity or amplitude mm -hmm. of the sound. Yep. Uh, but as you change amplitude of the sound, I mean, you can sort of, you know, modulate sine waves to or to have more of a polyphonic uh, flavor. Uh, let's say, you know, when you put different sine waves uh, mm -hmm. in a harmonic way, yep. uh, it creates a much larger breadth of the uh, of the information. So, one thing is, is there actually really a restriction? That imposes us to really look at something at one pixel, out. Yeah. or so. I was going to ask with these stars, is it still one pixel, or is there a way to? Yeah. All stars that we look are points. points we yeah. don't, they're so small relative to what we're looking at. They're they're <laughs> yeah. just dots, and the ones that we're looking at are in distant galaxies, so they're yeah. definitely just dots. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's no, you don't see anything at all. Like, because if, even if you look at something like Jupiter, yeah. um, mm -hmm. our closest planet, if you look with your your eyes, it looks like a dot, right? With yeah. a telescope, you can see a bit of a disk. Yeah. But that's one of the nearest, biggest things that we have. Yeah. And stars far away, are, and they're all just dots. They're all just dots. And yeah. is there anything else that affects besides uh, the the stars? Uh, forgive me for language, but the stars changing their spectral filters. Yep. Is there anything else that affects those colors? Let's say if the uh, dark haze or, uh, you know, if a black yeah. hole was relatively close to us, maybe it goes in front of a couple stars, mm -hmm. but we don't see it, but it still affects it slightly. Um, um, yeah, so uh, dust gets in the way, for example. Mm -hmm. And they... So you can see that pattern of dust. Almost. Yeah, so we've got a... Um, people have made a map of our galaxy yeah. and mapped out the dust lanes and where there's a really strong absorption and where there is less absorption. Uh, yep. Dust lanes. Yep. Okay, that, now you. <laughs> now this sounds interesting. I mean, although we're restricted to a single pixel for the stars, the dust lanes do span a bit more than a few pixels, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they can be really big scale features across the sky. So yep. you can actually, if you look up at the sky and look at the Milky Way mm -hmm. with your naked eye, mm -hmm. you it's a it's a bright band, but there's actually dusty lanes across it. And interesting stories from the um, the Aboriginal people from Th that's Australia. That's right. In, yeah. They 
thought that the they instead of making constellations out of the bright patches that they could see, yeah. they made constellations out of the dark patches. Out of the dark patches, yeah. yeah. That's that's the really interesting kind of unique mm -hmm. uh, you know way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, here in the southern hemisphere, we get a special view of the Milky Way because the Earth is actually oriented with the southern hemisphere pointed towards more towards the center of our galaxy. Yeah. So if you think of like a, a dinner plate, um, mm -hmm. the Earth is pointed to be able to see most of the dinner plate from the southern hemisphere and mm -hmm. just the outer, just the edge from the northern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So in the southern hemisphere, we might have a much more dramatic um, Milky Way that yeah, you can see way. more of our galaxy. Mm -hmm. But that obscures the galaxies behind it. So that dust is yep. really strong along the disk of the Milky Way yep. and then gets less as you go up to the, sort of the north pole and south pole of our galaxy. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say it's a bit more, it's a bit as if... Uh, Say you take a, a cup of coffee, a cappuccino, mm -hmm. and you sprinkle a bit of, um, you know, some chocolate on top mm -hmm. to turn the liquid underneath around, mm -hmm. and that it, and it just, you know, spirals, and then you have these highways of dark patches and highways of uh, star masses and clusters. Yeah, yeah. So we and then when we're looking at our own galaxy, we're looking at that edge on. So we're trying to look through all of those things. All of those, yeah. All of the multiple spiral arms and the stuff that's in the center of the galaxy and things so that that's all sort of in a disk obscuring our view mm. um, but then the the dust changes all around us there's dust mm -hmm. and there's different patches of the universe or our local environment that are more or less dusty have you, have you seen the dust over time with those photos uh the dust is very subtle, very subtle um yeah. so do you want me to draw a picture of what a spectrum looks like of a yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah or something because yeah. the the spectrum is what you get is you get a, a sort of how bright it is with um well this is just sort of a random spectrum but what I'm drawing is basically how uh, bright something is so I'll say the the flux you get the light yeah and representing that as a line which is high when there's lots of flux and low when there's less mm. yeah. I didn't actually, I didn't really draw a particularly good yeah. supernova here, but <laughs> uh, you can see there's there's some absorption and sort of a whole different shape of the light curve. Yeah, so you find mm. meaning well, out of those sorry, trends. This isn't a light curve, this is a spectrum, because this is as a function of wavelength. Yeah. So the bit on the right is red, um, and the bit on the left is blue. And if you start off with something that's particularly blue, it if you have dust, it absorbs blue light um, more effectively than red light. Okay. So it reddens things, which is also what well, it absorbs and scatters it, which is also why the sky is blue yeah. and yeah. why the sun looks red, because the red light is able to travel through more unimpeded, whereas the blue light gets scattered. Mm. And so okay. the blue light. And that's here, dust? Is this, that's pure dust well, or just any. It's dust or particles, and okay. you've got the air particles, you've got yeah. water scattering. I things. thought it was mostly water that was doing that kind of. The, yeah, the water, water gets. Makes, um, uh, clouds and is very annoying for astronomers. Um, <laughs> but if you had, if you have some dust, it will tend to make this uh, a bit fainter than it should be in the blue, and then it won't, won't affect the red very much. So it will. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell how much dust there is by the color that okay. you see. Okay. So that somehow we could sort of do a a, a hue conversion. Uh, the thing is. That, uh, I'm not sure that dust is very so. If you could go and get these dust maps mm -hmm. from the from the um, that people have made with yeah. our supernovae, we you can't until you've applied the dust map. It's difficult to tell. We're not directly measuring that very one easily. The, well, there's dust in the host galaxy and stuff, but one mm -hmm. of the things they do in robotics to measure any change is just new picture minus old picture, and that yeah. gives you a really good edge definition of shape. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's there is a there's a specific equation in when it comes to uh, reverberation mapping mm -hmm. is to figure out the rate uh, R minus L. We can figure the yeah the radius luminosity relationship is that yeah. one. Yeah. So the the things that I think would be most useful to to turn into sound is the light curve of the um, supernova because you can hear it getting brighter and fainter and as you say you can turn the the hue into the yeah. Um, the frequency of frequency, sound, and yeah. you can turn the amplitude into the amplitude of sound. Yeah. Um, and so that would be easy to do, and also you could 
then do the same thing for the reverberation mapping for the MGM, the, the, the active galaxies with the black holes in the centre. Yeah. And you could have the same process be done to the light curves from the centre of the galaxy as well as to the spectral lines. The spectral process lines. the spectral lines and yeah. measure them getting brighter and fainter. Yeah. But we what we want to know about that time delay. Yeah. So you could potentially hear the light yeah. curve from the photometry mm -hmm. with then with a small time delay hear the same thing in the spectroscopy. Uh, so there's these the, the, the issue to, to really identify, you know, the redshift of an AGN and you know to, to be able to properly calculate its mass is that you take you are just looking straight into that object and then there's this kind of normalization that occurs with the redshift and the different you know troughs and, and, and peaks and what you're trying to do is you're trying to associate you know like uh, take the time shift to understand where you know you have an actual you know a, an actual change of the redshift that allows you to understand the distance. I mean, I'm, I'm really coming <laughs> butchering yeah. the thing, but yeah, the, the redshift doesn't change because we're looking just at the when we're looking at one active galaxy, we're looking at the the, the redshift of the photometry and the redshift of the the spectroscopy is the same. Yeah. Uh, so we're just looking for the time delay. Yeah. And the we've got a light curve that is basically goes up and down from the photometry, yeah. and we've got a light curve that goes up and down from the spectroscopy. Okay. And the spectroscopy is what we're measuring is how bright the emission lines are yeah. and how that changes with time. Yeah. Whereas the photometry we're measuring how bright the how images bright. are in the different filters and how that changes with time. So there's four different light curves yeah. with the four different filters yeah. for the photometry mm -hmm. and there's one light curve for the spectroscopy um, for, a for each particular emission line that we look at that changes. Okay, so all of these can actually be mapped into uh, into sonification, mm -hmm. or sonification, a sound based yep. interpretation of that information, not yep. only the just a visual one. Yep. Um, in terms of you know tools that you actually use to to really kind of visually analyze that, mm -hmm. uh, would I be correct uh, in saying that you know you want to be able to stack all of these different lines, and you want to be able to stack the graphs when there's a timeline be able to kind of uh, stack them together more um, horizontally, let's say depth-wise, to put them all together to see if there's, you know... Uh, you don't necessarily want to stack the, the lines. Yeah. What you want to do is uh, basically hear the lines changing. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so we're... we're oh, I, meant, I actually meant, sorry. I, um, I misrepresented I miss, uh, it, is if you have the visual mm -hmm. uh, representation of these lines, yeah. um, I haven't seen what's on the board, but yeah. visually, would it be just kind of graphs with, you know, X being time as usual and Y being yep. an amplitude, but that is separated into its, each component? So we would have four, say, take so carbon four. four as a line yep. in the spectroscopy. Yep. That particular line, mm -hmm. which looks like a, an upside down V or a pyramid, mm -hmm. um, it will uh, it will get higher and lower depending on how bright it is. So what we do is we measure how high or low it is at a particular time mm -hmm. and map how high or low it is versus time. And that's the plot that we see where you see it getting brighter as the, the curve will go up yep. and then go down. And that, so that would be what we were talking about where yep. It would just get louder and fainter mm -hmm. as the light got brighter and fainter. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So that 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 would allow. So visually, if you, you do have that with a three D graph, graph, let's say uh, flux, uh, yeah. uh, lambda, and time. Yep. So we. So on a three D, yeah. Control you can, So we have for the photometry, we have the four colors. Mm -hmm. So we can look at how those four colors change with time. Yeah. Um, and the and so you can look at that um, as a you could sort of look at how those go simultaneously. So you've got those four curves all happening simultaneously, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the um, spectroscopy. You can look at how that that's changing at the same time as well. But there should be a time delay between that. So, so that would yeah that would allow actually a proper uh, representation using sound because although sound um, you know when it comes to computers and 
you know, a lot of people say 3D space, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not really 3D space. It's actually stereo, um, stereo padding. And there is a problem which has not been solved yet. I'd love to have the time to solve it, but uh, it's called, uh, it's, there's a lack of vertical audio uh, when it's uh, digitally uh, outputted. Mm -hmm. So in the analog sense of things that we can, you know, really hear things above and below, although our ear tends not to be as uh, accurate in representing, you know, those sounds, uh, the sound locations, um, if we actually associated, you know, those different lines mm -hmm. across the stereo panning spectrum, then we can differentiate, you know, we can sort of si simultaneously, quote unquote, visualize what is happening with all of the graphs in was, one go. Yeah, I was imagining that you could have the photometry sound in one ear and the spectroscopy sound in another in ear, other, yeah. and see if you could hear a delay between what happened on the right and what happened on the left. Yeah. The spectroscopy doesn't have quite as much detailed information as the photometry, yeah. so you would be trying to hear something sparse in your left ear to something detailed in your right ear, Okay. but um, that would be interesting to see if you could actually tell. So the sparse in the left ear, that means that could remain kind of, you know, in lower frequencies somehow? Well, it would, so the all of it, we, we don't, because we don't like observe 24 hours a day and have like continuous input. Yeah. All that we have is a data point one week, a data point the next week, a yeah. data point the next week. And we can put, draw lines between it or make a smooth curve between it to interpolate, them interpolate to what's it. happening in the middle, but that will always be approximate. Yeah. yeah. But we can still make that smooth. Mm -hmm. um, and for the photometry, it's not too bad because we've got um, reasonably frequent. Yeah. If the things that are varying as slow as, slowly as the things that we're watching measuring once a week isn't too bad. Okay, yeah. Um, but the, the sp spectroscopy, we've only got once a month. Yeah. So every four, um, yeah, every four photometry months. points, basically, there's one spectroscopy there's one point. Spectroscopy. So it'll like go beep, 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 and then you'll get beep, one spectroscopy. <laughs> and so over how long, though? Uh, uh, for about six months at a time, or five months, months at a time. time and then there's a gap of seven months, and then we have another um, year. Uh, August to January. I remember that's yeah. the period within which it's a... Uh, yeah, and some of the time delays we're looking at are over a year long. Mm, okay. So a lot of the time delays that we're looking at, are we're actually trying to link um, one year's photometry with the next year's spectroscopy. Yeah. Because the time it takes for the light to travel from the center from the black hole out, bounce off the clouds, is um, can be a very long time. multiple of, months. Yeah. And then the red shifting as the light comes towards us as well actually puts a time dilation in it which adds extra time. Mm -hmm. Long story short, you sometimes can be listening for delays that are a year or more, mm -hmm. um, which obviously we would want to speed up somewhat yeah. in the sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you wouldn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the same thing with the uh, currently, uh, we've got about 400,000 stars which have been captured, uh, modified, uh, you know, frequency uh, modulated, filtered out into, you know, uh, each of its frequency modes. Mm -hmm. and then put back in um, and there's actually what's interesting is that they, you can identify what a like an O star would be you know, versus an M star yeah. um, but okay so pretty much you know taking note of this is that just pitting uh, the spectroscopy which mm -hmm. is uh, one over you know one over four uh, verse uh, no not the spectrum the light curves which is one over four and the spectroscopy which is yeah. yeah, so that's the ratio that we can take and then we can sort of make interpolations between uh, and we can just kind of further granularize things with the uh, RGB yeah. and I mean the four filters. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that would, I mean this is for the active galaxies but we could also do it for the supernovae. So you could do discovery of supernovae because there's a lot of things that change in our images. Yeah. So if you just take the same patch of sky yeah. mm -hmm. and um, make some sort of audio about each of the dots yep. somehow yeah, you yeah. could potentially hear one getting brighter mm. um, and the kind of things that go through our images include asteroids that are in our solar system yep. um, and variable stars yep. and supernovae and these active galaxies that vary and all of these varying things are in the image yep. so if you put six years of data together with weekly imaging mm -hmm. then a gap for the season and weekly imaging then a gap yep. Uh, there's actually a lot of, there's a wealth of information in there that would absolutely. be interesting to hear what uh, it sounded like. Yeah, absolutely. And then find what the causes are for those mm -hmm. dis disturbances. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, it's almost like, a, you know, just being able to listen out there, you know, and j 
just to go, well, I'm going to pinpoint over here, yep. and I'll just keep listening to it. And I'll just put it almost like a background sound or something, you know, to, to, to see yep. what's happening over there. But this information, uh, I guess there's a lot of information which is processed. Would you recommend that we go and see the team at, uh, in Western Australia? The I think it's the Australian part of the square kilometre, right? The, yeah, the MWA. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, yep. MWA, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a that's a different survey altogether. Mm-hmm. But they they've got um, lot heaps of really interesting information on their survey, so that's a good place to go. Do you think uh, they might have targeted some of the same objects as the uh, as the dark energy survey? For sure. Yes. Um, okay. So there could be. Uh, we're tar- targeting the same patches of sky. We have quite different resolutions and obviously different wavelengths that yep. we're using, but yep. they'll there's overlap. Okay. All right, we have a trick question. Yes. <laughs> I'm worried, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's very, it's very, uh, how should we say? It's, it's, it's very gentle. <laughs> yes. What do you think of astrology? <laughs> There's, astrology, astrology usually is giving pretty good advice to people. It has mm. nothing to do with the stars and relationships to human bodies, but it's... It's interesting. If, if people are being told... You should watch your money this week, or you know, yeah. be nice to your your neighbour this week. It's good advice. And yeah. but interestingly, um, uh, the you can see where astrology came from mm. because it comes from something that actually does make sense. Yeah. Because ancient peoples could see that depending on what stars were in the sky, yeah. your season was different. Yeah. So the environment was different, and you could see. And sometimes birds were being born. Sometimes it was a good time to plant your crops. And so what stars were overhead definitely yep. affected what goes on on life on Earth. Yeah. And that's because of the orientation of the Earth and when it orbits the sun, depending whether you're in, you, your, your side of the Earth is tilted towards the sun or not, yeah. you get different um, climate weather. Mm. Uh, and so the idea that where the stars are in the sky should affect life on Earth comes from a sound basis which we now scientifically understand very well yeah trying to say that has anything to do with relationships or human beings or yeah, thing, that's that. we know that that's yeah that sh- <laughs> shouldn't have any relationship yeah. but symbolically still you know the, the the symbolism not only of you know there's a lot of constellations which have names from mm-hmm. the zodiac and you know like the that's that's kind of yep. 360 degrees separating 72 degrees and you know, all of these have some kind of foundation on mathematics, but the the, the, the modern interpretation of it, of you know, as you said, you know, yeah. trying to predict, you know, uh, who's going to go with who, you know, if you put everyone in a club, okay, that person's going to go out with that person because that person's this sign and that sign. That's yeah. that's not true. Right. Uh, yeah. But people, uh, you can see if you go out into the middle of the outback in Australia that you can see why people worship stars or and spent so much time and were so much more familiar with the constellations and could use them for navigation and all of these kind of things yeah. because it's when you're outside city lights it's so bright and beautiful and um, it contains heaps of information yes uh, and yeah. so of course people would use those and the ancients were much more familiar with that than modern humans are did you it'd be great to put it back uh, i mean if we know that even dumb beetles actually orient themselves Apparently, relatively uh, relative the to the way. direction of the Milky Way. Don't know about that, but maybe. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, have you ever had a contact moment? You know the scene in Contact where With she's yeah. Jodie Foster. Yes. Yeah. I've never been contacted by aliens, unfortunately, <laughs> but I have had exciting times at telescopes and yeah. really exciting aha moments at telescopes. Could so. you tell us one of those moments? I remember the first time that I was looking at an active galaxy which we've been talking about and we weren't intending to we were meant to be looking for supernovae so we were trying to find exploding stars yeah. but sometimes because we're looking at dots it's difficult to tell the difference at first mm-hmm. between an exploding star and the center of an active galaxy that's changing in brightness mm-hmm. and so we targeted this active galaxy and I was very new at this so this is like my first time observing at the telescope for this type of thing and I said, the spectrum popped up because you check the data as it comes in and I was like what is that? Mm. And I had the same sort of process that went through the minds of the people who first discovered these and didn't know what they were. I'm like, I have, I have no idea. I can't match up any of the lines for this. And I asked my mate, I was like, um, hey, what's, what am I looking at? He's like, oh, that's a quasar. I checked like Reggie 4. So I, I had a look and I checked and I lined it up and I found out what it was. 
and realised that what we just collected in our telescope was light that had been travelling across the universe for about 12 and a half billion years. And I had one of those moments where I just, I just pushed back from the desk and was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and that just goes to show, one, how empty the universe is, yeah. that this, has been tra- this light has been travelling for 12 and a half billion years and the first thing it hit in all of that time awesome. was the mirror of our telescope. Yeah. And also the fact that how much we can now understand as humans that we, I can look at that and I can understand and know that that came from a, the light of, from this disk of gas around a supermassive black hole in this distant galaxy. Mm-hmm. And I can understand that I can understand and look at something that happened and literally watch something mm-hmm. that happened before the Earth formed. Because the Earth is only four and a half billion years old. So yeah, yeah, yeah. this has been traveling for well over double the age of the Earth, the of the almost Earth. three times the yeah. age of the Earth. Yeah, to see something that, to know, to actually know that, I mean, it feels, I mean, personally, the first time I had this this moment that really haunted me for the rest of the night is when I first saw the ring on Saturn. Mm. And, you know, my dad, you know, opened the yeah. the book and said, look, this is Saturn right here. Well, look at over there, you know, that yeah. little yellowish kind of spot which is up there. Okay, have a look. Boom, look at the telescope. Okay. I'm small. Yeah. <laughs> Such a distance. <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah, it's um no, it's it's twelve twelve billion light years away. So it took twelve billion years for the light to get to us. To get to us. Yeah. But what if it was actually close enough? Because this between the expansion of that light and the position we were originally mm-hmm. relative to that light. Yeah, so we, when the when it emitted the light that we're seeing, we would yeah. have been much closer to it. Much closer to it, yeah. Um, and it's now moved so far far away. Far away. Um, and exactly all the calculations for that are, we won't need, don't need to go into. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, it yeah. the light has been travelling that entire time. Yeah. And it's now even further away, and mm. what we're seeing is no longer there. Yeah. Because that galaxy has been evolving for another twelve and a half billion years since the light was emitted. Since the light was so we're looking at something as it was in the past. It's like literally doing active archaeology by flying back to the past and seeing what it looks like. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so we're blessed in astronomy that we can really look, we can watch the infant universe and see how it evolves. Mm-hmm. And you'd wonder what's happening there today. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, you know, past twelve billion years. Yeah. The yeah. other um, question. Uh, well. We know you like frisbees. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but there was also you also had a not really a contact moment, but maybe a moment, you know, that led you perhaps uh, to take this to take this route. Mm. Uh, we have something for you. Oh yes. Uh, we'll probably try to put it in the crater, although the uh, <laughs> the scale is not the same. Yeah. So you have a something that looks like an impact crater in a model here. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think it's the Mars rover landing site. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you've got the space shuttle. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I did study the space shuttle as a kid. Is this the thing that you're um, talking about? Yeah. My memory? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, um, as, um, as a kid at school, we got to study this special space shuttle launch that was happening. It was. Uh, it was special because of the first time um, a normal person, a school teacher, was getting launched up, yeah, up into space. And <laughs> so um, here in Australia, the launch was in the middle of the night, and I must have been excited enough because my parents agreed to wake me up in the middle of the night to watch the launch live. Mm. And of course, that was Challenger, and the space shuttle exploded um, a mm. bit over a minute after launch. Mm. And that was one of my earliest memories of thinking about the uh, space travel and stuff like that and I'd, I'd wanted to be an astronaut um, mm-hmm. while learning all about this and then after that experience I really wanted to be an astronaut <laughs> um, yeah. which seems counterintuitive but it was pretty it was just learning about it and seeing the difficulty of the endeavor and what people were willing to sacrifice to do it was mm-hmm. really inspiring so I think it's interesting that even failures can be I- inspiring inspiring um, and uh, have you it's a it's very it's a risky, challenging uh, endeavor to get to space. Yeah. Um, but it's very very interesting and well, I'd say 
it's it's really pioneering um, you know it's it's really kind of it's it's that human curiosity mm -hmm. and that's what keeps us inspired I don't think it's you know I don't think it's necessarily um, you know materially material rewards and things like that but it's really how where our imagination takes us and in some ways we're actually taking that information that information that we've gotten at some point in our life and we keep refining it further and further mm -hmm. and further you know until we at least are able to just take that curtain and just move it aside and understand the universe a bit more mm -hmm. uh, it seems like that's our you know that's the way um, a lot of you know investigative minds uh, kind of you know yeah. Or, yeah just just take that direction and to kind of uh, you know keep themselves happy and joyful and just super motivated and passionate about mm -hmm. what they're doing so there's a yeah. there's a lot to be learned by pushing ourselves to do things that are really difficult and that we don't know how to do yet yeah. mm -hmm. we learn so much on the way yeah. that regardless of or not of whether we achieve the final aim that we were that we were pointed towards yeah. you learn so much along the way that you end up much enhanced from from where you began and as a human species i'm hoping that we end up much enhanced from where we have where we are now um, well um we're going to uh interview um diane mcgrath who is the mars one it. candidate yeah. from australia yeah oh, we can pause it, can we pause it? yeah pause it yeah. one second um, I think I know what this is. GoPro stop capture. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to interview Diane McGrath, who is currently in Arizona in the biosphere, uh, going through, uh, I think it's a six-week training. Mm -hmm. uh, she is, her responsibility is to actually understanding the recycling process, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the team of 24 who are maybe, perhaps, hopefully, uh, going to join Mars in mm -hmm. uh, 2032. Uh, do you have a message for her? Good luck. Do a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to see the results. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, Safe for today, uh, thank you so much, Tamara, for this conversation. It was really inspiring. Good luck uh, with the rest very, of your adventure. Thank you. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, well, this is our first podcast. Uh, we have a zero podcast, but this, this is our first podca podcast. If you guys are interested, please go on Astro Hunters uh, for what? Facebook groups and then what else? Astro Hunters, uh, like and subscribe if this is on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, GoPro Stop Capture. <laughs>